Hey guys, welcome back to Mondays at the Museum. I'm Carrie and I'm here at the Anna Bemis Palmer Museum in York, Nebraska. So for today's Mondays at the Museum, we're going to be focusing on World War II, more specifically the start and end of World War II, because we're going to be celebrating the anniversary dates of both the start and the end of World War II this week, ironically, I know. Uh, World War II started September 1st, 1939, and it ended September 2nd, 1945. Um, we know now what World War II became, you know, Germany plus Japan plus Italy versus the world plus or minus a few nations who decided to flip-flop throughout just depending on what was valuable to them at the time. But at the beginning, it was basically just two nations against each other, which was Germany versus Poland. We know now what it developed into and the cause and effect and stuff that still affects society today, but at that time... It was just those two. But it's really interesting how things got started. If you don't know the stories, if you haven't taken a high school history class, I actually don't know if this is taught in a lot of high school history classes, but uh, basically World War II was supposed to start even earlier than it actually did. Hitler's plan was basically to go to war on the 25th of August instead of September 1st. He made plans to order his men to attack on the 26th of August, but that got canceled because Mussolini, who was an ally of his in Italy, no longer agreed to support him due to Britain and Poland signing an alliance. Um, basically, eventually, Hitler ran out of patience, as he does, and on the 31st of August signs the order to attack the next day, aka September 1st, 1939. But... He couldn't just attack Poland. That would look bad, and it also might bring other nations to war against Germany. He needed justification. So what he did was he took some of his officers from the SS, and he dressed them up in Polish uniforms, and he actually had them attack a German radio station. So 8 p.m., they attack this radio station. They broadcast an anti-German message over the air. They leave, and when they leave behind, they actually leave behind bodies of concentration camp inmates, but made like unrecognizable, so people couldn't tell that they weren't, you know? Uh, and also they left behind a German man who everybody knew to be sympathetic to Poland. So it made it seem like the Polish people attacked first and that Hitler is basically just, you know, defending his homeland at this point and that it was a justified thing and he gets to go on and be the big hero. If you do more research, you're going to see actually a lot of false flag operations happened kind of this week and, and around this week, but this is the one that's the most known. Um, I, It's a little depressing uh, to know that, you know, he did start all this with a false flag, but he was very strategic like that, and basically that just gave him enough time to go in and start the charge. Um, World War II ended... September 2nd, 1945, and it actually ended very differently than when it started. It ended with the signing of something that was called the Instrument of Surrender. Basically, it took place on the USS Missouri, aka the Mighty Mo, in Tokyo Bay, and it was a ceremony. The ship was packed. If you look at pictures or videos, it's packed. It's got sailors, it has important military brass, the press of course, um, reps from nine allied nations and General MacArthur who gave a very nice speech. So what happened was just before 9 a.m. Japanese reps approached Missouri on their own little ship. They boarded completely in silence, took their places and there was like a little brief ceremony where MacArthur spoke and some other people spoke. And then they signed the Instrument of Surrender. So why the USS Missouri, aka the Mighty Mo? So President Truman was in office and Missouri was his home state. Also the previous year when he was senator instead of president, his daughter is the one that christened the ship, which is pretty cool, uh, when it was launched into the New York Harbor. So after this is signed, a few weeks later, the ship goes to New York 
Thousands of people are there to greet it, including the president. He describes the vi- the day that it visited as the happiest day of his life. And you got to think it's like it's a huge relief to him as president with all the stress that wartime can be. Um, the ship itself now is anchored in Pearl Harbor, which works out because that is where World War II started for the United States. Um, it's become a memorial to World War II, and there's actually a plaque. Where they signed it, there's a plaque on the deck that you can visit and, and read, which is pretty cool. So, And if you visit it, I definitely want to see pictures, so definitely post those in the comments. So today, we're going to go and we're going to see some of the cool items that our collection has that are World War II related. Okay, so there are quite a few items in our collection that are World War II related. I'm just going to focus on a couple of them now. So, during the war, there were a lot of things that were being rationed because they came in limited quantities. Things like rubber, metal, clothing, and of course food. Uh, The government then issued these ration booklets to each American. And the different colors, you see red and blue, on the stamps basically were based on different food items. And once you had used up all your stamps for that month, you can no longer buy these rationed items until you got your next booklet. Um, Also included are these tokens. So for each stamp, it takes 10 tokens to match it. Uh, They made blue and red ones, just like they did for the stamps in this book. These items were donated. um, The tokens by Donald and Ramona Ellison, and the booklets by Mary Ann Fitzpatrick. Uh, Moving on, here are some dog tags for a man who fought in World War II. So these belong to Joe C. Oxley, and they were donated by his mother, Mildred. Joe was born in Ottumwa, Iowa in 1922. When he registered to join the war on June 30th, 1942, he was a banker living in Mobile, Alabama. Joe survived the war and was married in 1981 to a Mary Bernardo. He then died in Los Angeles in 1990 when he was 67 years old, and he's buried there at Forest Lawn Memorial Park. Another item in our collection is one for the other side. This is actually from some German headgear. And you can see here that it has those mounting brackets. And here is a canteen from the U.S. side, of course. And these are just a few of the items that we have here in our collection that represent World War II. And if you want to come and see the rest of them, you're just going to have to come and visit us when we open here soon. We hope to be open really soon. And you're going to see all of these items plus more at our America at War exhibit. Right, guys? That means yes in Mannequin. You have to learn to speak Mannequin in this place or you will go insane. So come and visit us at the Anna Vemus Palmer Museum in York, Nebraska. We hope to be open soon. Any comments or questions, hit us up in the comment section.